Perfect. Well, welcome everybody to Historical Roots of Our Time. Um, this series uh, launched between the his department, his history department at UNCG and Humanities Network and Consortium. So I'm Elizabeth Perrell, and this is originally organized for my class, um, which is ARH 370 African Art Ancient Civilizations to Colonial Contact um, and beyond, <laughs> as we'll see today. Um, so I was able to organize a little um, Zoom in from Germany. Um, and I'm going to introduce our speaker um, momentarily. So here we have with us Dr. Amanda uh, Maples. And maybe can we somehow pin, I'm going to pin Amanda for now. Ha ha, you're on screen. So Dr. Maples is a research and database coordinator in Hamburg. Um, with the Digital Benin Project. Um, and she is also simultaneously curator of African art at the North Carolina Museum of Art. Um, and visiting she has been visiting faculty at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill. Um, she was a curatorial fellow at Stanford's Cantor Art Center. She's worked with Yale, the National Museum of African Art, the Smithsonian Institution, the High Desert Museum, UNC, or UC Berkeley's Hearst Museum of Anthropology, um, and I just wanted to mention, I most recently reviewed with a student from the class that is going to be viewing this, um, her show um, with the Na National Museum of African Art, Good as Gold, Fashioning Senegalese Women. Um, so we wrote a joint exhibition review, which was a lot of fun to have kind of a multivocal student professor review um, that we're submitting for publication together. So it's kind of cool to have an undergrad publishing as well, which is kind of fun. Um, so Dr. Maples is going to be talking about um, her work with the um, Digital Benin Project and without further ado, I'll let her take it away. Hello, nice to meet everyone. Um, before I share my screen, um, where I guess I could go ahead and share it and I can kind of introduce myself. Get that done. Yes, everything is good. Mm -hmm. um, so because this was originally for a class, I will pose some questions throughout it that we might have uh, the opportunity to discuss at the end of it, or it might be fodder for Dr. Perrell to talk about with her students at a future date. So yeah, I might refer to something that they read or the questions that they can think about um, throughout this talk or a little bit later. So just giving you a little bit about the format of it. And as she mentioned, I I'm zooming in from Germany, so it's about six o'clock here. I've had a nice long Friday already, but I'm so thrilled to be here. Um, and as she mentioned, I'm also the Curator of African Art at the North Carolina Museum of Art. I'm a North Carolina native, so it was exciting for me to come back to North Carolina to curate African arts for my North Carolina community. And I'm in Germany to be the Research and Database Coordinator for Digital, Digital Benin, which we'll talk about today, and which is the, the background of that screen there. So I'll be talking about the Benin Kingdom Arts, which I'm working with for that project, uh, restitution very broadly as well as specifically, um, and then my work with Digital Benin and how it relates to those things. So I'll do a short presentation and hopefully there'll be time for Q&A afterwards um, if I don't run on too, too long. But here is a rough outline for the lecture. So what do museums do? Um, thinking about the problems of the past and how they inform the present problems of museums that we're experiencing in contemporary politics. Uh, the history of the Benin Kingdom, why it's the most important and visible of the restitution's cases, and then how it relates as a case study to the broader issues and debates surrounding restitutions, reparations, and museum ethics. So this will lead into a meaningful conversation about these global issues uh, surrounding systemic racism and those protest movements that we have here in the United States as well as elsewhere. So if you think about uh, Black Lives Matters uh, and SARS and how these are sort of parallel and complement the urgent calls that museums have received um, to face their colonialist histories and to be colonized. That's another um, sort of, I guess, term that I hope we can unpack a bit either in class or uh, later or maybe in this talk, we'll see. Uh, so we can discuss thinking of these objects as global citizens as well, uh, or Afropolitans, uh, and or that term decolonization. So these objects kind of um, represent these coming together of different cultures, but also this sort of gap in time when they left the continent and have been off of the continent for far longer than they ever <laughs> were necessarily on. So it's interesting to think about these global citizens, these objects as global citizens. So um, I know a lot of you can't answer because you're not necessarily here, but who recognizes this scene from a recent movie? So hopefully 
some of you do, you recognize it. It's a pretty popular, famous scene from a movie. Uh, and who then knows the real story that it's referencing here, because there is a real story here that they're, they're acknowledging in some ways. So I'm hoping that some of you have figured that out um, when you saw this movie, if you saw it, and then that it is a thinly veiled reference to a specific time and a specific museum. So with the advent of global protests urgently calling for social justice and the end of systemic racism, violence against black bodies and police brutality, so again, thinking Black Lives Matter and SARS, Roads Must Fall, museums, like other institutions, have been called upon to reflect on their own institutional histories and to grapple with um, the role that they've played in perpetuating stereotypes and inequities. So both in gallery and collections displays, um, as well as within their own administration. So a critical aspect of museum pursuits to decolonize includes facing these violent histories um, and the colonial imperial nature of those histories. So why? What do museums do? How did they come to be these imperialist sort of organizations or kind of inheriting that history? What have they done? So I want you to think in general about what their role in contemporary society is now and what it has been in the past. Um, and the, the debates happening today are not new. That's something else we need to consider. They don't come from nowhere, just like the scene doesn't necessarily come from nowhere. Uh, they're related to some very real histories that museums have had a hand in and that are being referenced in the scene. Uh, so stereotyping, for example, colonial conquest, art markets benefiting from war booty coming from Africa, museums flattening identity, telling single stories. Um, there's sort of a sign of civilization to be able to display the art and culture of other um, places and, and cultures around the world. So some, some questions then that we could ask would be, how did museums come about and for what purpose? And I don't have time to get into that whole history today, but think about it. <laughs> are museums racist institutions? This is something people are asking today, inherently. And if so, or if not, can they highlight diversity while still being equitable? Can they shift? Can they pivot? Um, how do they shape and define something like African art as a canon? And then what kinds of arts or geographic regions are typically um, included or excluded when we think about or display Africa? Are museums obsolete? That's something else to think about. And people are saying, you know, empty the storerooms, take apart the museums, they're imperial things, like why do we still have them? I want you to think and discuss about those, um, those issues. And then how do they come uh, by the objects in their collections? I've, I've highlighted that a bit because that's the most important question for today in thinking about the mean kingdom objects. How did they enter these Western museum countries and collections? And then what's next? Um, these days it's all about provenance research, transparency, collaborations with other institutions and communities, and then restitutions and partnerships, which is um, of course a bit more what we'll focus on today. So again, as you might have guessed, that scene was from Black Panther, um, the blockbuster movie Black Panther. Um, and it references a very real history and is that of the Benin Kingdom. Uh, and a very real museum, um, though it was shot in the High Museum, I don't know if any of you knew that, it's shot in the High Museum in Atlanta, but it's actually referencing the British Museum. Um, so this, the British Museum benefited very greatly from an 1897 raid on the Benin Kingdom that effectively ended its reign. It's still around to some degrees, but we'll talk more about that specifically. Uh, so let's back up and think about Benin Kingdom arts to which this movie refers. So the Kingdom of Benin was founded around the year 900, but it reached the height of its power in the 15th and 16th centuries. And you can see it's um, located here in present day Nigeria on this map. You can see how big it was. It accompanied, uh, encompassed a lot more than it certainly does now. Um, it, so again, it, was, it reached the height of its power in the 15th and 16th century as a result of the conquest of new territories uh, by two kings, uh, Oba, which is King Eware, and it's his son, Oba Ozalua, uh, royal art from this period, which is much of what we see in museums, um, and also in the 18th century, was designed to broadcast and strengthen dynastic power to kind of support this kingdom. So such court arts celebrate the prestige of monarchy to outsiders, like traders and ambassadors, but it also um, broadcasts this power to those who might try to wrest it from you know, internal powers like courtiers. So they also tell the histories of the kings and their conquests amongst other things. So it's a way of telling histories and narratives. Um, Oba Siki is especially known for commissioning great artworks uh, as well as festivals. So you might uh, recognize this from your reading if you've done readings for this class. 
Um, and this is to legitimize his reign. So festivals and art legitimize power in a reign. Um, and his in particular had a tumultuous start. So he used art as a way to kind of legitimize and, and fix that <laughs> a little bit. So we're looking at the case study of the British raid on Benin City, because as you might know, this is the most famous case and the one drawing the lion's share of the attention in current restitutions debates, which we'll discuss uh, towards the end of the talk. So during the Benin Punitive Expedition of 1897, more accurately titled The Raid on Benin City, the British stole a great deal of the art and wealth of the Benin Kingdom just mentioned. So the city was captured, burned, and entirely looted. Much of this art was accessioned into the British Museum. They have about 900 works still today or sold off to finance the raid. So they wanted to pay for, <laughs> yeah, we're going. Um, so this is a rough sequence of events that I've put on, on the slide for you. So in, in a nutshell, against all advice, acting British Consul General James R. Phillips insisted on visiting Benin City in early January, 1897. And Benin City is the capital of the kingdom. So the OPA had asked him to delay because of the Agwe ceremony which is a ritual requiring his complete isolation from visitors. So it's a very strict law of that ceremony. So although the subsequent British colonization was probably inevitable in some ways, which we'll talk about in a little bit, Agwe's timing and Philip's obstinacy catalyzed the chain of events which led to the conquest of the kingdom. So that's kind of a little bit of a nutshell, but I'll, I'll give you a little bit more information here. So the story goes, the British were on the coast and they wanted to move inland and Benin was still independent at the time. Uh, and further, they were charging the British traders uh, customs duties. So the British didn't want to pay those duties. Uh, so with the use of various fill in the blank treaties, which is pretty common at this time in Africa, they were able to primarily do that except for the Kingdom of Benin. So Ralph Moore, who was a consul general, wanted the foreign office to put together an expeditionary force. So they were already talking about this uh, to, and I quote, be stool the fetish priest. However, while Ralph Moore was on leave, James Phillips, acting consul general, decided to go talk to the Oba himself. So this is kind of a political coup by a British officer to resolve the situation before Moore got back and then take the credit for it. Uh, so he put together a group and headed out, although he had been told by the king, it's not a good time, don't come. Um, it's, again, it's a very, uh, you know, he's not allowed to have to be disturbed, there's no visitors allowed from the outside. It's a very sober time, there's no burials, there's no marriage, there's abstinence from sex. All of that um, is happening, there's fasting as well. Um, and occasionally a diviner will prescribe a human sacrifice to avoid disaster during the yam harvest, which it usually corresponds to. So this is part of what the British use as an excuse uh, to call this a, um, a savage kingdom, which is utter nonsense, but they use things like that. Um, so this took place on the seclusion chamber's threshold when the oboe was about to enter and again just before his exit, these kinds of um, human in, in involvement. So under Moore's authority, but also trying to undermine him, Phillips approached Benin City with eight British officers, 200 porters, and a band, um, but he was ambushed. So the British officers were killed, uh, and Moore now had a reason, or a cause, for the annexation of another bit of Africa, which he'd already kind of been wanting to do, and now he just had a perfect excuse. So the punitive expedition set out about two months later, um, and so that's actually pretty quick at the time, uh, led by Sir Harry Rawson with 1,200 British troops, um, and the Oba was put on trial and exi ex exiled to Calabar. So you can see here um, a song written about this time period, just there. And I can send these slides for you if you'd like. So in short, within less than two months, the British had... <laughs> privately funded punitive expedition that came and conquered the city, looted, photographed, and burned the building. Um, and then these piles of artworks were shipped to London and often through Germany, by the way, through Hamburg, which is a major port city, which is where I'm located right now. Um, they were accessioned primarily by the British Museum. And then uh, a selection was given to Queen Victoria and then the rest were kind of dispersed globally. Um, so, and again, to defray the cost of the expedition. So that's kind of what happened in a nutshell. And then these are some of the unexpected results of that punitive expedition. The European art market was flooded with these technically sophisticated, aesthetically beautiful artwork, this royal artwork. Uh, their European response was amazement followed by disbelief. And this is not uncommon in Africa at the time for Europeans to go, Africans can't make beautiful art and just believe it. And then come up with these wild stories about 
uh, wandering Renaissance bronze masters from Europe being on the continent, just utter nonsense. <laughs> so here are a couple of examples. These are the kinds of things that we're, I'm working with in um, the Digital Benin Project. This ivory piece on the right, very, very famous, and on the left, a brass head. Um, and then here's a couple more works on the left. Those are life-size uh, leopards in the British Museum, brass stool on the bottom left, beautiful, technically sophisticated works. And then on the right, there's a whole number of these bronze plaques that tell the stories and the histories and, of the kings um, and their exploits or their stories or how they came to power or how they um, hold power divinely, things like that. And they would have been, um, you'll see in a picture later, um, probably in a narrative way uh, displayed on the walls to tell about these stories and exploits. So they're a way of like recording and transmitting uh, stories and histories of the kingdom. And then they were taken all apart and dispersed. So how, how did this happen? How did something like this raid, which is such an egregious thing that is painful to talk about today, happen? Um, so we're gonna back up a little bit in time and think about stereotypes about Africa and African art very, very briefly. Um, so what paved the way for such an egregious event, which has today become the most visible case study of looting and restitutions efforts in African arts, if not the world? Um, let's think about these stereotypes that have been created about Africa. Uh, originally, opinions were very positive and prolific trade agreements and relationships were developed between Africa and Europe. It was pretty positive. Um, and Africa was seen as a place of great wealth and kingdoms. So this document shows the attitude about Africa during this pre-colonial period. So the Viard Atlas, which is owned by Viard in 1547, that's why it's named that way, uh, shows West Africa as if someone was standing in Europe and looking at the continent. So the orientation of maps that we know today where uh, Africa is in the global south and um, global north is up didn't exist yet. So I love this perspective because it forces you to think differently about the continent, look at it from a totally different perspective. In any case, along the coast of Africa, you can see here are representations of kings shown sitting on thrones and wearing different kinds of crowns. Um, this follows Chris Steiner's argument that the artists had never actually seen any of the people, so they were just using European ideas and descriptions, um, you know, second and third hand information. And they were most familiar with Asia, so they actually represented some of these kings with more Asian features as well, which is really curious. And it also shows how misguided they were. So attitudes about Africa changed drastically over the centuries since the Portuguese first arrived and since something like this map was created. So first it was overwhelmingly positive and respectful and then this wholesale flip occurred as part of the colonial project. So this is something I talk about usually much longer. So I'll try to kind of get it. Amanda, yeah? The good thing is that also our, we just came out of the Portuguese Sapi relationship in our last unit. So you're there, we're there. Okay. Excellent, we know about this. So yeah, regardless of these facts uh, of you know, it being a, a place of wealth and kingdoms and sophisticated art, um, in the 19th century, Africa was considered isolated and stuck in time. So that's a stereotype that is, is pervasive. So this is not logical at all, but it's based on convenience and um, ethnocentrism, of course, resource exploitation. So this is about how, when those perceptions started to shift is what I've got in this slide. So there's a desire to avoid the Silk Road. There's advanced technological innovations of ships and seagoing vessels. Um, and they wanted to get to the Spice Islands much more quickly. So Africa was in the way. Um, so so uh, the Treaty of Tordesillas was signed and authenticated at Setúbal, Portugal. And it divided the newly discovered lands outside of Europe between Portugal and the Crown of Castile. So um, this is along a meridian of 370 leagues west of the Cape Verde Islands off the west coast of Africa. So the line of demarcation, as it's called, was about halfway between the Cape Verde Islands, which was already Portuguese, uh, and the islands entered by Christopher Columbus on his first voyage. So the lands to the east would belong to Portugal, the lands to the west to the Castile. Uh, so in short, Columbus went off and discovered America. Portugal got jealous and they began to complain. And so the Pope stepped in to these squabbling children and um, in 1493 issued the Papal Bull. And he basically stated that Spain was to go west, Portugal was to go east, and the problem for Portugal then was the continent of Africa. Um, so again, they were all tr they were trying to get at those spices and Africa was sort of in the way for Portugal. And this is when things started turning. So instead of that positive view, it's kind of like, well, we need to build a narrative that allows us to kind of take over Africa in certain ways. 
Um, so then over 100 years after that Bayard Atlas, adventurous Dutchman named Alfair Dapper traveled to Africa, China, Persia, and the Arab nations between 1668 and 1680. So he was one of the very few Europeans who went more than three miles inland <laughs> during this period. He published travelogues about what he saw and his reactions, and he described Benin City, so the capital of the Benin Kingdom. Um, in, which is in present-day Nigeria, as I mentioned, as more beautiful than Amsterdam with broad, clean roads. The engraving used in this book illustrates the mean city, but of course it has some problems. There's picket fences and neighboring churches and things, and the houses should have been clay, and you know, they, they were second, third hand, fourth hand information, right? But it's still, we can see in the next couple of slides that it, it isn't completely off base. So uh, this illustration was probably created by those second or third hand descriptions. And there was still that sort of positive yet confused view of Africa at this time. So we, we also have Bini representations that were made at about the same time. So we can compare and see that some things are accurate. So you can see that the, the, the turrets here with the snake and then you can just see the feet of the bird here that would have been at the top of these kind of towers here. So he's not completely wrong. <laughs> so Benin and Dapere representations of Benin City show us an example of this early contact. Benin City was the royal city and capital of the kingdom. Um, it was huge and had miles of walls surrounding it, which are going to be excavated soon for the new museum that's developing, which we can talk about if there's time. And it had a distinctive architecture represented in both Benin Arts and Dapere's accounts. So his account actually reads, and I quote, it is divided into many palaces, houses, and apartments of the courtiers and comprises beautiful and long square galleries resting on wooden pillars from top to bottom covered with cast copper on which are engraved the pictures of their war exploits and battles. And he's referring to the plaques that are now in museums worldwide. Every roof is decorated with a small turret ending in a point on which birds are standing, birds cast in copper with outspread wings. Um, they're bronze, but still, he's mostly clay. <laughs> ah, it's metal, no matter. So, and most interestingly, we have Bini representations of the Portuguese as well from this period. So while soldiers didn't actually go to Benin city, the Bini absolutely went to the coast and that's where they encountered the soldiers. So we know that these are surprisingly accurate because we still have Portuguese armor and manilas in museums. So we know that they were spot on. Um, we can date the plaques according to the details of the armor as well. So as I mentioned, a lot of European illustrations were created on written descriptions. We have very you know, in inaccuracies essentially. Um, and based on sort of the telephone game. So you do your best from third, fourth, fifth information. But these Bini representations are pretty spot on. And so regarding the Benin City's architecture and its descriptions, I wanted to show you two works that are currently on display at the NCMA. So you can actually go and see them and which can help open up these conversations about museums holding these royal objects. Um, and these two are actually reminiscent of the architecture in Benin City, which is like why I like to talk about them together. So Benin Ancestral Altars, which is the one on the left, um, usually features several cast metal bells. So this would have been part of a shrine. Uh, this altar bell is in the same rectangular shape reminiscent of the towers that we just looked at um, that would have been part of the royal compound in Benin City. Atop these towers were birds. So that's why I have the one on the right, capping these rectangular towers. So both of these together depict the royal city. Uh, so the bird speaks of ill omens that the oboe was able to overcome. He was able to assert power over both the spirit world and the physical world. So together they embody an entire city that supported the king or bidding his supporters to support the king. So they're also kind of communicating that power, reminding that they needed to serve the king. And this is because if you have done any reading, Oba Sigi instituted a festival called Ugi Oro, which refers to the Ida war in which leading courtiers actually refused to support the Oba um, in his defense of the city. So in the festival, and he actually ended up being victorious. So in the festival, these high-ranking courtiers were made to process around Benin City, striking these bronze staffs with birds on them, the bird of prophecy as it's called, to remind them that they refused to support him. And uh, he shot down the bird that prophesied that defeat and then went on to be victorious. So it's a way for them, him to remind them that he has the wisdom and they should follow his lead well, and, and uh, support his power. Amanda, I also yeah. love the way that there's this metaphor of like, that the courtiers are squawking birds. So they're hitting oh. these things and it's making this clanging noise. And they're the bird that prophesized the Oba's defeat. And the Oba was like, guess what? I won. You're wrong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So these literally were all over the place reminding them of that, of their place. 
um, yeah, that's great. <laughs> you mentioned that. Um, always refer to the wisdom of the king, essentially. So similarly to the way the Spanish and Portuguese were squabbling over regions, by the late 19th century, Europeans began to squabble about who would control what areas and what resources of the continent. So as such, the Berlin Conference was set up, which was a meeting between European nations to create rules on how to peacefully divide up the continent for colonization. So each nation had to prove that they controlled an area to claim it and to, to maintain that control. So less peaceful for those in Africa, of course, it was a horrifying carving up the continent a redrawing of borders and boundaries that denied any existing cultural language groups or borders. The meeting was convened by Portugal, but led by Otto von Bismarck, uh, the chancellor of the newly united Germany. Um, the resulting agreement was a general act of the 1885 Conference of Berlin, banned slavery, but otherwise encouraged aggressive colonization. So in fact, if Africa's human and natural resources weren't effectively exploited enough, and this is under the claims of the principle of effectivity that was part of it, they would lose the claim to that territory to another colonizing nation. So they were encouraged to actively and aggressively take control of areas. And you'll note that this is just a few years before that raid. It's not too long before that happened. So this scramble for Africa by leading European and world powers resulted in the carving up the continent, an act that was formalized at the Berlin Conference of 1885. So again, versus uh, various stereotypes and rhetoric supported um, by circulations of visual imagery and travel descriptions of Africa paved the way for such a thing to happen. You can see what the continent would have looked like before the Berlin Conference on the left, and then on the right you can see how quickly the conference changed the map of Africa to more closely align to the imaginary borders that we see on the continent today. So as we've seen, in a nutshell, the very, there was a very dramatic change in the way Europeans and Westerners viewed arts of Africa and a desire to continue to carve up the continent aggressively. So started to be published as a place of savage barbarians, uh, of lower status, these heinous rulers, cannibals. Um, this all also fed the desire for trade and political and religious control of the continent. So all of this worked together and against the Benin Kingdom. So Africans were seen as the prototype of the human evolutionary process. They're seen as a, a past version of so-called civilized man. Um, and this is part of the reason that museums collected all these other primitive men. They were trying to uh, sort of rescue or save these disappearing civilizations that were earlier um, on an evolutionary uh, timeline versions of man, which is, you know, we know this today to be wrong, but that's still some of the mindset that was in place that led up to the, the raid. So Africans, um, the state treasures of kingdoms as part of this, such as Benin, Ashante, and Dahomey, which are all in West Africa, were taken to Europe as war booty following the defeat of exile of their rulers by European forces, so in Benin Kingdoms not alone. Um, and this formed the basis for rich collections of newly established ethnographic museums. So that's a bunch of history in a very quick time. So the takeaway message is that even though early European perceptions of Africa were based off of very little real information, uh, there was an overwhelmingly positive perception of Africa as a place of wealth, kingdom, and empire. It was well respected. Um, however, after the Portuguese and other Europeans started coming to the continent, they saw an opportunity and needed to change the narrative. So they paved the way for the carving up of Africa as part of expansionist rhetoric and in order to plunder its rich resources. And of course, gold, as it was in the Americas, uh, was a big part of the wealth that was sought as were slaves, human bodies. So back to the raid. Um, this is what paved the way for this raid on the Benin Kingdom. All those things kind of had happened and just created the perfect storm for it. Um, and of course, the proliferation of thousands of royal and court art to museums and private collections worldwide. So Nigeria was colonized a few years later by the British. Um, they patted themselves on the backs as being successful. And Nigeria remained under British control until 1960 when they gained independence. Fast forward to today, uh, with activists, activists in Europe, America, and elsewhere highlighting these histories and actively taking charge to make the restitution's calls more visible and to make actual change and movement happen. Because guess what? This is not a new conversation, which we'll talk about in a minute. Many, um, as you can see here on the left and the right, many of these use Benin Kingdom Arts as the mobilizing force and the visible manifestation of these histories. So you can see that there. So it's obvious here that museums greatly benefited from a history of violence and specifically from this raid. And here we are in the 21st century, trying to figure out how to grapple with these histories and with these treasures amid urgent cries, and again, not new, uh, for their immediate return and for reparations more generally. 
So what can museums do now? What are some of these challenges, limitations, the opportunities? Um, so I have a, a, so many here that we could think about. I won't list them now. I think it's a good opportunity for a discussion later. Um, and I also then wonder, can museums pivot? They're inheriting all this, uh, this mess in some ways and these objects, but what can we do next? Um, restitutions and reparations, are they possible? Um, and perhaps we can discuss, of course, the American versus the European context too, which is also different. Um, and I will say in my opinion that the most important conversations happening for museums today are restitutions, reparations, equity, transparency, provenance research, collaborations and decolonizing um, museums as well as mindsets. It's a much deeper decolonization that's at stake here. Um, and this more broad circulation of objects more equitably, so more global circulation of these objects, rather than all being in the global north, they should be circulating more um, globally to kind of make things more balanced. So one of the ways I like to explain it is, would you ever see a presentation of British royal treasures in Nigeria? No, probably not. So why are all of Nigeria's treasures in the UK and elsewhere in the world? It's not balanced. Um, Fromont explains it similarly about French, the Louvre is the place where French citizens are made or, or sort of explained, right? So why would we rob Africa of that opportunity to, um, to have their own royal treasures to tell their stories? So it brings, it just brings us back to restitutions. So we hear this word a lot, restitutions. I've already said it many, many times throughout the last half hour. So what do we mean by it? Um, how does it parallel the larger conversations happening in the United States and globally right now? Um, and about reparations. Again, Black Lives Matter, decolonize this place, another big one. Um, the activists that stole art from the K. Bron Lee uh, and SARS protests, which are much more broadly calling for the, uh, the condemning of corruption and sort of um, urging for systemic change in Nigeria, which kind of parallels what's happening in the United States. So I just want you know, to see that this is a much bigger conversation happening all over the place. Um, and that's different. It's slightly different from what has happened over the decades. So basically, the greater scrutiny on museums goes hand in hand with the attack on the power dynamics that are at play in racist politics and uh, policies in a much broader sense. So I'm just drawing that parallel between what museums are kind of experiencing with restitutions and these bigger debates on um, racial injustice. So as important and headline grabbing as this issue is, it hasn't simply emerged in the last few years as it may appear. So Benedict Savoie, amongst others, has cited numerous archival examples in Germany, France, and the United States, uh, United Kingdom, sorry, from the 1970s through the 1980s. Um, the former director of UNESCO, like many others, cited the robbing of memory and knowledge needed to construct identity. That's a really important phrase. Like this is a robbing of, of the knowledge needed to construct identity. And this is a national identity as well. So calling it a legitimate claim, he requested that the art treasures that best represented African societies that were most vital be returned. But he also noted that not by means all of them. Uh, we still sort of need ambassadors to tell stories globally. So that's one of the conversations that's happening. However, there's an even greater longevity that originated in mobilizations of the 1920s and 1930s. So the restitution debate certainly became visible in the 1970s and 80s, but the idea of restitution, the dream of restitution has a longer and deeper history, which can be traced in speeches, articles, books, and oral memories that should all be studied by historians and in order to form the present moment that we are grappling with. So even before the quest had been made almost immediately after works were taken. So, so there were actual immediate requests for them to be given back um, in the early 19th century. So in short, this conversation was begun 40 plus years ago based on deeper tenets was legitimate and reasonable, uh, but lost traction is only now resurfacing with urgency. And so repatriation, restitution, return, reparations is a longstanding global problem. And these words get used interchangeably in the media when we're talking about it in general, it, it kind of happens. So let's look at what we actually mean by those words. And I will also share this with you. So repatriation, restitution, return, reparations. I like to call them the four R's. <laughs> Confused, used interchangeably. This is something that um, happens across the, the debate. So to clarify, repatriation is the process by which objects are returned to a state or a nation, while restitution constitutes a return to an individual or a community. Um, there might be competing claims within those as well. Uh, and reparations involve these processes, but also implies a philosophical component of repair and healing, including the official acknowledgement, apology, and atonement for past wrongs. 
for admitting my bad. Uh, so this may involve seeking out other voices, the exchange of objects more broadly, and the opportunity to better define cultural diplomacy. So essentially the process is a repatriation of agency. One of my favorite ways of talking about it. So reparations is a conversation happening in this country as well, as I've mentioned, and certainly globally in, very, in different ways, in various ways. So in terms of return though, the concept can get confusing and complex, uh, which won't have too much time to get into, but I hope you can later, uh, because many of the current country borders didn't exist at the time that the objects were taken. So that's a problem. Uh, you've got culture groups that have shifted or changed and kingdoms have fallen and risen. You've got different legal issues. You've got competing claims. Um, you've got, you know, museum ownership issues. There's all sorts of things to grapple with. So the call is legitimate. The call is right. It's the, the problems that we're dealing with in terms of actually getting to that, doing the hard work. And this is why I wrote this, this article, I think some of you have read, um, because I wanted to look at those complications and say, here's action items. Here's what we actually do, because this is a big complex thing that feels almost too big to get done. Um, so I actually looked at these issues, um, you know, to what degree can one consent without colonial context is what, as well, which is inherently uneven, looking at the power dynamics, and just also saying, even if you don't have the exact provenance research of an object, you know, such as with the Benin Kingdom, that a certain number of objects came out at a certain time because of a violent conflict. So those can, without a doubt, be said to belong to a certain place. So then we can talk about issues of co-ownership, circulation, loans, returns, all of those things, even if we don't have the precise provenance history, which does take a long time to get. That's the other thing. People complain that provenance is, uh, research is taking too long. They're not wrong, um, but we can find issues like this, which is why I think the Benin Kingdom has been so visible and such a good case for people to latch onto to talk about these issues, because it's a very distinct time and place where things were taken. Um, so I talk about that in this article and of course published the NCMA work in there to talk about it because it has this little plaque on it that very proudly states that it was taken during the raid in 1897. So, so what can we do? And here's what I drew out in that article. Um, you'll note the third one down, which is the phase we are in now, and that includes in-depth provenance research, um, which is now especially being conducted with urgent in museums worldwide. I've been talking to all of them, so I know this to be true, um, and especially with the Digital Benin project that I'm on now. So we will include that information, and hopefully it will be updated live for any museums that use an API or that connect to our database. And so, you know, the various answers are, I hope, coming soon. So certainly things are actually changing, too. That's another difference um, between this decade now versus the 2030s, the 70s, 80s. Um, and I, I just cite one of them here. Um, so in addition to museums starting to make returns of objects from other countries, private citizens are making returns of an, uh, artworks that were inherited by, um, that, that they inherited that were taken from the Benin Kingdom during the raid. Uh, the Rhode Island School of Design, the RISD Museum, uh, they have actually deaccessioned their, uh, their head, their commemorative head, because they're trying to return it, but they're also running into problems. So this is a really good case study to look at because they have competing claims between the palace and the government. And so they can't actually figure out how to get it back and they are trying. So they're actually joining with Digital Benin and including all of that information with the hopes that they can get it returned. So I think things are finally getting traction and that's important to note. It's not, it's not hell, it's, it's actually going to happen. So Digital Benin is a large contribution to that change and will open up new possibilities for the assembling, tracking and sharing of these colonial era objects globally. And so I think we're also setting an important precedent that other colonial era objects can um, kind of take advantage of. So we can look at certain other time periods like the Biafran War when um, other works were you know, exported from the country unethically. Um, so this is setting up a really good precedent, a really good infrastructure that's taking us a couple of years to build. So we're doing good work that can apply to other, not just African colonial era art, artworks, but hopefully globally. Um, so this is again, not a new conversation. And the claims on these objects have been made since nearly the time they were taken, but we're finally seeing some movement. And uh, I'll note that Digital Benin grew out of the Benin Dialogue Group, which is another consortium or group that was formed back in 2007. And it was um, European institutions joining with Nigerian institutions and stakeholders to come up with guidelines and to help um, returns to actually happen. To, and they are the ones that called for these um, lists of objects to be made 
to be transparent about where these objects live, about their provenance histories, um, and to make this available easily to people. Because that's the other thing is if you're, depending on where you're sitting, you might not have access to even know where these objects are. So that's essentially what Digital Benin is doing. Um, I don't think I have too much time to talk about this, but I do like this idea of um, artists having also a different say about what restitution means to them. So this is one of my, my favorite artists that talks about artwork being a way to create restitutions and to make new meanings and new histories. Um, it also opens up that conversation about artworks being sort of Afropolitans, as being global citizens. Uh, they've lived multinational, multicultural lives. They speak many different languages. Um, so where we are at now, because they're not the same objects that they were a couple hundred years ago. That's the difference. And so we have to think about a contemporary view and bring in contemporary viewpoints on these objects. And um, oral histories is actually something Digital Benin is collecting so that we can have these sort of artist inputs, um, you know, local inputs and, and, and sort of language input on these objects. We can talk to the royal family and see what they think about these. So we're collecting all of that now. Um, oh, and, and the one, thing I, one thing I wanted to kind of say is even, I think that it's a real mental shift for a lot of students sometimes and even faculty and everybody to think that, oh wait, the categories of archival creation mm -hmm. build the knowledge. So mm -hmm. unless you have those original conversations, your archival categories will only be the colonial categories. Mm -hmm. So unless you have community input, you don't even know how to make the archive. Exactly. So it's, it's one of these things that like is a real kind of like mental shift <laughs> for a lot of folks. We're like, wait, actually, right. We don't have the same words for things. Right. Yeah. We and don't so have we the thought... same mental slot to put it mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. it's great. Yeah, yeah I think there's that really valuable oral historical knowledge and a very different way of transmitting knowledge, power, authority, um, history, all of that, like in the plaques, for example. And now mm -hmm. there's a giant gap of time um, to where that knowledge couldn't be transmitted properly. And so there's this gap in time. So now we have contemporary perspective, which will lend a lot of really valuable, meaningful insight. But it's still in a contemporary perspective with a big gap of time in which their royal objects were robbed from them. So the, the ability to have this um, identity creation, to have these stories told, taken away. So I think that's an important way to think about it, about these sort of global citizens, these objects being very different now and living different lives. Um, so what we do with them. Uh, and so I just have a few slides for Digital Benin. I didn't necessarily want to walk through all of them. Um, but this is all the reason that I joined the project. I was writing that article. I was interested in being part of a solution that reconnects these communities to their heritage um, and which includes notions of the intangible. So emotions matter. This um, sort of intangible history and the way that it's told and collected is so important. It's imperative to these objects. And they have been divorced from that when they entered the museum collections, when they were collected by these people that did not collect that information, did not care about that intangible heritage. So that's a big part of the problem. And so I wanted to do something concrete. Digital Benin is doing that in my opinion. Um, so it's, uh, it's not directly dealing with restitutions, but it is a huge step towards transparency and equitable access to these objects. So it includes vital research of those oral historical knowledges that I talked about, contemporary narratives and perspectives, and we hope a seamless blending of digital um, and curatorial knowledge. So we're trying to think technology and curatorial knowledge doesn't have to be a separate thing. It can very much inform the way this platform comes together. And we've been talking about a very people-centered approach rather than an object-centered categorized approach that a museum would typically take. And so that's also um, innovative. That's something that's a bit new. Um, so in some ways we will then set up a pipeline for stakeholders to know where the works of art are and how many of them are there, which at this point we found over 5,000 objects in museums. This is not even private collections. Um, and to be able to view a wealth of assembled knowledges on them. So it's a, it's a user-friendly digital platform that brings together all these different kinds of knowledges, not just, um, not just straight data like words, it's different kinds of knowledges. You might have songs, um, you might have video interviews, things like that. And, um, makes that available to stakeholders around the world, especially, of course, Nigeria. So here's kind of our little fact sheets that we tend to, to give to people. Um, but it's a two-year project, um, develop and design of an online platform. We have all this collection, these different phases. 
Um, here's the funder, you don't need to know about that so much. Here's our team, there's me on there amidst other people. So I'm very much in charge of the research side of things, talking to the museums, which we are talking to over 150, so I'm very busy. Um, and then we are doing things like this, where we look at the online catalog, we look at what they've got in their internal databases, and then we find a way to include that in a platform. And the, way, the reason this is tricky is that every museum has a different way of building their data um, and different ways that it's accessed. So that gets super complicated. <laughs> um, there's different internal data management systems, various methods of data access. There's, um, there's institution, you know, just very specific things about the institution um, in terms of restrictions or licensing agreements. There's a myriad data formats I lost my little ability to go. There we go. Um, and then, of course, we're doing a connection layer. So yeah, there's all those different ways of looking at the data. And then there's a translation layer. And then there's the interactive narrative tools that would be beautiful and easy to understand. And then on the back end, it looks something like this. Where we're looking at all the different field names. And you can see where we've color coded the ones that are likely the same information, but called something different in a different museum. So that's a little bit of an inside uh, view of things. And then here's another sort of table to show you what it looks like. There's that internal institution specific database. Then there's all these ways of giving us that information. So there's an API. I don't want to go into what that is. Um, you can look it up CSV or JSON. So you can just get an export of something in an Excel file um, or a manual, which is nothing is digitized, um, which a lot of museums in Nigeria, for example. So we have to go and actually get that information and digitize it, type it up, create that data, that data set and then connect it all in one seamless way into our digital platform all the way there on the right. And you can see at the bottom, we have three phases. So we're very much in phase one, which is that research and that data collection. So that was sort of the um, quick and dirty what Digital Benin is doing in a, in a real way um, <laughs> explanation. But I think it's more important and more fun to talk about the more philosophical things that we're doing, which is opening up that opportunity to have conversations about restitutions, to, to talk about return, and to work closely with stakeholders in Nigeria. Um, and I, I think all of that background history that I gave you is why something like Digital Benin exists, because we need to find a way to do that hard work, two years of work just for one area, one time when things were stolen from Africa. So now think about the work for all of colonial era objects and your mind gets blown a little bit, but we got to start somewhere. And that's why I flew all the way to Germany to work on this project. <laughs> Well, and I think the thing, thank you so much. That's amazing, <laughs> by the way. Um, uh, that, but I think the thing that actually, I didn't, I didn't think when I started my work as an African art historian that I would ever see this happening. I mean, it's really sad to say, but it was like the thing that my generation wanted to do and you're just slightly younger than me. And I was like, I don't know if we'll ever be capable or have the infrastructure, like you said, infrastructure mm -hmm. to start making this happen. And I loved in your article where you said that NAGPRA is a great yeah. model that at least in the United States, people can kind of get their head into sometimes mm -hmm. that it's, it's, it's happened. There was a, there, there, it wasn't always easy, but at mm -hmm. least it, it is a thing. <laughs> it's, big, it's big, but it can be done. Yeah. Um, and I think the trick, especially in the American context, is that we're so far removed physically from Africa, which means it's not easy for African stakeholders or even diaspora people to come in and say, what have you got and, and why, you know, I need to know more about it so we can decide if it should, if it belongs elsewhere um, mm -hmm. rather than here. So it, it's a lot easier in an American context to, you're at least on the same continent. Um, but I do think that NAGPRA is very helpful because, yeah, it shows you that the mountain is big, but you can climb it. And, mm -hmm. and that's why I'm in Digital Benin, because we're taking two years to start climbing the mountain. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, and if you don't start, it's never going to happen. Well, get it. Yeah, exactly. That's, but that's why it stalled, you know, in the 20s and 30s, and again in the 70s and 80s. Like, this is, that surprised me. I was like, oh, this is such a new hip thing. You know, everyone, not, not hip in a negative way, but like, this is the spirit of the times. It's time to start making these reparations and getting these things back. And then I started digging a little further. And I was like, this is so not new. They've been asking for these things back for since they were taken. So why does it seem so new? And that's, I think what I tried to get at in this talk is just like, here's all the baggage that comes along and why does it feel new or why is it different? Because it is slightly different. And now we have technology on our side. 
so we can open up those storerooms in a meaningful way that you can access from your uh, your chair anywhere. As long as you have internet, that doesn't mean it's accessible to everybody. You do have to have internet. So yeah, but it's it's almost like our tiny brain, human brains, couldn't get the data. Well, a we couldn't get the data because we couldn't get into the storehouses and get into the archives and find those actual like, you know, it's this whole thing of big data being a positive, not just something that's kind of um, numbers crunching and just finding keywords. It's like, no, 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 no. There's a much more philosophical thing going on here. Like it's not just people with privilege who should be able to go into an archive, period. Yeah. Like that's the part that gets me because to me, when I came into art history, where there was this whole culture of, well, what archive do you go to? And do you bring chocolate to the archivist? And I'm like, this seems gross. Um, but because it was, it smacked of favoritism, old boys network, mm -hmm. everything about privilege. And it, I felt like an outsider immediately. Yeah. Who has um, the power to access that knowledge? That's something that's very much at play here. And so that's what's something we're, we're being more equitable and transparent just by going out and doing that work and gathering it in a place where it is accessible to everyone because it has been guarded. And, and mm -hmm. yeah, you, you would have to be, you know, one of those few that had the education or the, the power to go into those storerooms, the time to do it, the, right. the locale to do it. Well, um, and, and even well, our students here at UNCG, like just the idea that only a Yale or Harvard student would get funded to spend a summer <laughs> working in an archive okay. and they were, and they do. And do we, do we have that funding? No, often we don't, but now we're starting to be able to kind of at least think about it. Actually, they just announced today, the Honors College here has like a summer program, $500 or $1,000 for students to research their honors project over the summer. And it's like, it gives that tiny glimmer that if they're sitting at home, but there's a digital archive they could access, they could at least start to understand the projects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we're dealing with that here, even in this project, because um, data, the, the data architect, his name is Eric Stein that I'm working with. Um, when we talk to museums, we always ask what isn't digitized because that's still going to be difficult to get to. And during the course of this project, would you have the time to digitize more for this project, for our stakeholders, mm -hmm. so that people in Nigeria can get access to it? So what? access is what? such an important thing right now. I have to go in like two minutes, but I also <laughs> wanted to say, because Jamie's going to Jamie's gonna pass it over, but the thing that actually I just participated in was for Black History Month, there was a citizen data entry um, typing activity that we all participated in as part of HNAC where literally, the, I think it was just through the Smithsonian, right? And they made it so you could come in for 15 minutes. And if you knew how to read cursive, you could digitize a document. I did two. Thanks. But they digitized like 8,000 documents that day. Wow. I know. Brilliant. <laughs> I was like, are you kidding me? Scientists have been doing this for decades now. Citizen scientists Amazing. track all the birds in the United States. I had no so idea. Why don't we have undergrads or grad students or professors who are celebrating a day of heritage digitize two documents? And yeah. then you can go back and check the data later, but they did the brunt of the work. Better than nothing. Yeah, and I mean, we're gonna have a lot of digitized documents that we don't have the time to transcribe or, or translate. And honestly, yeah. if it's in cursive or it's in Portuguese, where it's in Swedish, which some of our stuff is. <laughs> so at least the Danish curator was nice enough to translate everything for us. But I mean, that already, it's a, it's a, um, it's a layer of blocking. I'm looking for a different word here. It's, yeah. a, it's a barrier, right? So anyway, if we had days like that where different people could come in and help break down that barrier, we'd all be better for it. Oh yeah. And I sure. love ideas like that. And I'll, I'll probably take that to my team as like, maybe we want to do that towards the end of the project. <laughs> well, and I could connect you with the people who did it for the Black History Month stuff. Yeah, okay, I have to roll out. So Jamie's going to field any other questions. I'm so sad to have to go. Thank field you for me. having me though. You're the best. It was great. <laughs> so carry on. I'm not sure I have much else to say unless there's questions. Are there any questions for, for Amanda, for, for Dr. Oh, May? Yeah, okay. 
Do you remember the Digital Games Project Nigeria National Sewer Art Story? Oh, yeah, um, that's a great question. So, um, well, first off, I'll say that we have the, the Benin Dialogue Group, which again is the reason that Digital Benin exists. Um, and we do have Nigeria, we have um, a representative from the National Commission of Mu uh, Monuments and Museums in Nigeria. We have somebody from the Legacy Restoration Trust, which is part of the archaeological project that's happening in Benin City now and is tied to the British Museum um, and the IMAWA, the Edo Museum of West African Art, which is the museum that they're building right now. So it's very much um, people coming together in partnerships equally from Europe and uh, Africa. We hope to have American museums join soon, but that has not been voted on yet. So fingers crossed. Um, in terms of Digital Benin, we, we have principal investigators that are on the Benin Dialogue Group. Um, and Koki is uh, one of our main professors. She's in Nigeria. She's on our, she's a principal investigator. Then we've got um, a couple from Germany, of course. We've got one from France who does a lot of provenance research. So those principal investigators inform the project and the, the goals and the vision of it over the two years. Um, and then we, of course we very much, you know, I'm a secretary of the Benin Dialogue Group. So I'm very much in conversation with them too. <laughs> um, and, and meet with Legacy to Restoration Trust, NCMM. Uh, we have representations uh, from the OBA on behalf of the OBA and from the, the palace. So um, they are all a part of this conversation in Digital Benin and in the Benin Dialogue Group. So there's no way we could do this without the support and the guidance of the stakeholders in Nigeria, because they are going to be the carriers of it in the future. So at the end of this project, I think it's important to note, um, we're not sure exactly how to look because Imawa is still being built right now, but the idea is that they will be the carrier of it. And if they're not quite ready to take on the infrastructure of such a big database, um, they'll just have a partner institution in Europe that can still carry it um, more physically. But ideally, it'll eventually be housed and cared for um, in Nigeria. So I think that's that's really important because they're they're informing the decisions we make. And then we have two research teams. There's a research lead who is part of the Institute for Benin Studies in Benin City. His name is Godfrey Ekator. Um, he's our research lead and he works with um, Elagosa Obovofo. And so she is also doing a lot of research and conducting those interviews with folks. So um, they're the ones that tell us they, they drive what we include in the database because there's also those big decisions to be made. There's like thousands and thousands of objects. Do all of them belong? Um, do all of them tell the story that they want to tell? So I often defer objects to them and they tell me, well, actually this is a masquerade that might've performed in the city for the Oba, even though it seems like it's from a neighboring community. So there's interesting stories like that, that we're including and that are again, driven by our Nigerian stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you for responding to my question. And thank you sure. for your work. This is, sounds like a, an amazing project. And I'm actually going to be teaching a philosophy of art course in the fall. And I want to talk about museums. So I'm hoping, you know, you're going to get an email from me <laughs> about <laughs> this, this project and a collaboration. Oh, I love this museum logic. It's such a curious thing. Um, and that's part of the reason I was brought on is that I've been studying museums and how they think about and kind of categorize African art for 17 years. So I came on with this like knowledge of museums, very particular logic that they have and the philosophies that are in place that have built kind of, as I showed today, they've built from these other discursive systems that were in place and to prove um, empire and to show civilization by collecting the world. The cabinets of curiosities are part of that, right? Mm -hmm. So you have this history of museums that show these imperial origins and that we're still dealing with today. And that's a big burden to try to get past. Um, so I would love to talk to, the, to anyone about this. Obviously, it's something that I really think about and care about a lot because it's a burden I've inherited as a curator of African art. And guess what? I'm white. So um, I have to think about those histories and how someone like me often gets the job um, and why that's problematic, too. So that's a whole other can of worms to open up to. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Chuck, did you have a question? I, unfortunately, I have to go, but thank you very much. It was a really interesting presentation. Thank you. Thank you. No, thank you, Amanda. I, if you need any help with citizen translators for Swedish, I could offer my services on that side. I just got a couple more Swedish museums on board, so quite possibly. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I work mostly on China and, and the, the Silk Road, and I had kind of a question about Dunhuang, because the Dunhuang Cave, I mean, this is shortly after this period, but Ariel Stein comes to, to 
Central Asia and then disappears with half of the, you know, the, the library collection, plus ripping the frescoes off the walls and ending up in the, in the uh, British Museum. And I wondered if there were catalogs that were written in that time that you can get in sort of a common mindset for the curators looking at the world beyond the West and how, and the language they use if it's kind of this common between the African continent mm -hmm. and Eurasia, if they had this kind of common way of looking at. There was, but there was also an ordering of it. So Africans were at the bottom, um, but and Asians and Native Americans were like somewhere a little higher. And then of mm -hmm. course, white Europeans and the language that they used to describe themselves was at the top. So I don't know if you've seen those kind of depictions of the different continents and the ordering of them. Something along those lines, yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, I think that would be a really interesting project to see if the language is very similar to the way that they were collected and talked about and ordered um, in Asia versus Africa versus, you know, elsewhere in the world. So, because they did come from, I mean, they were be, shortly after, shortly before the raid on Benin, you have this, the sacking of the second summer palace, the destruction of it during the second opium war, and then the taking of all yeah. those, all of those artifacts disappeared. Yeah. And, and it goes back to several levels of Chinese officials. I mean, Chiang Kai-shek's widow, Song Meiling, before she died, when she was 101, that's the last thing she was talking yeah. about was trying to get, get back. The, get them back. Yeah. Yeah, I, it's such an interesting way to tell history, and it's not the way that we are told this history. Hmm. So I think if we flip it on its head and talk about these ways as an access point, like what was happening in the world at any given time? So if you look at the sacking of Benin Kingdom at the same time we're looking at that sacking, it's like, oh, that that changes the narrative. Yeah. And I, I love that idea. We should do exhibitions on things like that. A look at a, a global snapshot of the world that show that history that's so often obscured intentionally. It's just like, no, we'll talk about all the people that won. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> and it, and inherited these questions. Yeah. yeah. No, it's fascinating. Mm -hmm. well, you know, one you. other thing, can I can I make one more comment real quick? Because I just I'm so fascinated by this conversation. Uh in in also because of its moral and political dimensions, obviously, which you did such a nice job of giving, you know, an overview on Amanda during your talk. But it seems to me like even this conversation about um, the the soon to be host country, the the country which uh, in which these artworks or the, the place in the world where these artworks first originated needs to sort of be prepared first before it can house these objects is potentially right morally fraught as well, uh, because mm -hmm. it's sort of suggesting that you don't actually get these back unless you are willing to <laughs> sort of play by the same rules of yeah. art preservation that we play by. Right. Um, and and there's, as you were suggesting, there's going to be options for continued partnership with European institutions if it seems like the, uh, the infrastructure, either digital or physical, is not uh, is not present. And I mean, that's another interesting conversation to have is this yeah. idea of, look, if it's going to be repatri repatriated, to what extent do, do the... Um, you have to the, let go. To, how, how, to what extent do, do the outsiders have a right to dictate how that art will be displayed? Or Precisely. Yeah. It's problematic to talk about these standards you know, of museum standards that are not something that, well, actually we've had a lot of conversations with our um, Nigerian researchers about how the um, plaques were cared for in a museum type way. Like they were polished, they were stored, they were cataloged, and then they were brought out at certain times to show the rain or to tell the stories and then put back again. There were caretakers whose job it was to care for those objects. So actually early ideas of a museum were in place but it's still on a different kind of framework. And that's, I think that you're indicating, and I've definitely talked about with others, that there's this like museum standard that's in a very Eurocentric Western mindset. And so there are some people, I think Smooth and Zewe at the Columbia University panel was like, you know what, if they want them back and they, they want to take them back, it's none of our business what happens to them after that. Like it can be cared for in a totally different way. And that shouldn't why, why do Western museums get to have a say in that? How, why do we get to decide what the standards of care are? Um, so I think it's a really interesting conversation. Um, and again, we have to follow the lead of, of those that have a stake in them. And that's why we're so closely in partnership with all of them. It's like, what do you want? <laughs> How do you want this database to exist and where? And, you know, it's, it's super interesting, but that's a lot easier than how do you want to care for the objects themselves? So we're just kind of, it's an interim step. <laughs>
Thank well, you. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much for your talk. And yeah. and um, I just want to make just one one plug for the next talk in our series. Oh, this this goes beyond Elizabeth's class. But um, next week at this very same time, we'll have the talk that just happens to be the talk that I'm giving with Rao Shao, who's in our department uh, in the Asian language and literature. Um, perception and reality on both sides of the of the Sino-American relationship. So we're looking at images of time of time Time magazine covers throughout the 20th century, which is a fascinating journey through perceptions, popular perceptions of what China is, and it's amazing what you can learn from these things. So, um, but thank you so much for your talk, and I think that the, I, I'm sure that uh, Dr. Perel's class is going to be all those questions that you you pose. I mean, there's so much there's so much to be talked about. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me and for such great conversation. And good luck with your talk next week. <laughs> oh, thank you. Bye-bye.